and welcome back to Frankly Speaking. I'm your host, Frank. Let's call this part 14 of Mussolini, an Italian-American perspective. Okay, guys, tonight I kind of want to pick off, pick up, excuse me, where I left off in the last cast, and that is basically dealing with some of the social structures of fascism, the idea that fascism was the worship of the state, and some of the notions that fascism suppressed individual rights, where the citizens of that society were nothing more than cogs in the system serving their leaders who were oppressive authoritarian, uh, I, I guess, uh, regimes where everybody was to serve the state at the end of the day. And I think there's some real concerns there, particularly the way historian Emilio Gentili highlighted in that video that I was talking about, at least his book, right? I, I didn't, um, I don't have the book. It's in Italian, it's very expensive, but there was a summary on YouTube that I watched that went through it that highlighted the supposed suppression of nature of fascism on a social, cultural level, something akin to a secular religion. And I expressed some concerns, but I also had some give and take where in that last video where I said, wait a minute, is there some nuance to some of these things that fascism implemented? And you can go back and listen to that. Now, in this cast, I want to address maybe some of the objections, right? Because a few things came to mind after that cast. And, um, and that's where we're going to go. Let's start, first of all, with freedom of speech, right? Which is a cherished, prized possession a cherished value of uh, Western liberal republics, post-enlightenment society, especially here in America. It's enshrined in our First Amendment. And the question of free speech in Italy was brought up uh, by Emilio Gentili um, in his book and how speech is, is suppressed. And once leaders give order in the fascist system, the cogs in the system, the citizens, are to not question it. Now, that's interesting because that's not something that I had read in other books. Again, I, I would have to go back. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put together uh, a list of all the, the sources that I'm using here. Um, my understanding prior to um, going through Mr. Gentili's book was that the idea of free speech originally, even before the American revolution was a Roman idea, right? The idea that the the, the Romans debated ideas um, and that free speech was a part of Roman tradition. And the fact that Mussolini himself considered himself a Roman, again, he was born in the province of Romagna, I believe it's pronounced. I think it's like 50 miles south of Rome. Mussolini always considered himself a, a Roman. And in that sense, in the spirit of debate, Mussolini himself was one that always loved political dialogue. And he was one, as many pundits have noted, as many historians have noted, he was always willing to listen to all sides of the argument. And remember, this is a guy that went from communism to fascism, had a real transformation um, and was willing to think through the issues. And you see him later on, especially, again, bringing the church into the ladder and accords. Um, the guy is always evolving. Now, in many ways, fascism is constantly evolving. And the reason why it's evolving is because Mussolini is evolving. He always said that he'd listen to every argument or every discussion or every debate. And if you could convince him, He'd listen to your to your arguments. He'd listen to your debates or your positions. And so when it came to free speech in Italy, and if I'm wrong here, please correct me, okay? Because I could be wrong. Because again, I'm giving you other sources. Again, I'm going back to Nicholas Farrell. I'm going back to Richard Lamb. I'm going back to... What else? I, I got a bunch of sources. I got to put it together. And from my understanding, 
free speech was allowed in Italy in a political sense where Italians could dialogue about political issues, bring up concerns to their governments. What wasn't allowed in Italy is to effectively call or lead a revolution against the government or even talk bad about the government in a sense where you were gonna kind of threatening to take it down and undermine the government. That wasn't allowed. Now, of course, they're dealing with Bolsheviks at the time. Remember that? Remember that little problem? And so maybe um, you could say that there's those restrictions are too much in the area of free speech. Um, but does a government have a right to suppress when nations or when individuals are talking about revolting against the status quo? I mean, this is a problem that governments go through every day. You know, apparently, and I'm not part of this in any kind of way, there's a bunch of good old boys in Texas getting ready to revolt against the American government. I hear that every other day on the Internet. How true it is, I have no idea. I have none. But I, I'm just bringing up a greater point here. Now, for me, I'm really... Okay, I know this is going to sound like an anathema to many Americans, but I'm not really a purist on free speech. I got to be honest with you. I think in the political sense, I'm a purist on it, right? In the political sense, we should all have a right to express our grievances, our political opinions. We should be have the right to discuss these issues. What is the best form of governance? What is best for our society? People should be free to talk. In many ways, like the Romans, I believe all ideas should be on the table, and, and especially in terms of politics. Where I get queasy with freedom of speech is quite simple. Slander, calumny, detraction, and taking the Lord's name in vain. When speech reaches the level of mortal sin, I'm not sure I'm down with free speech. That's a problem. That's a big problem. And I got a feeling, and I could be wrong here, I'm not a theologian, that the church probably condemns those as well, too. So... In a political sense, yes, I think free speech, go at it. But when speech turns into mortal sin, I'm not a purist. Does that make me uh, a communist now? <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. I'm defending the teachings of the church effectively is what I'm doing. So you got that, right? Uh, freedom of the press. I think that's another one where it gets a little murky with fascist silly and maybe this is open to critiques on fascism now Mussolini did not okay okay he shut down some newspapers okay but not all of them he tolerates certain levels of dissent right he reads the newspapers and he allows for so much of it Again, he's open to the debate. He's open to the discussions. Uh, but when it reaches a certain level where, again, there's lies and slander and calumny um, that present themselves in the press, he shut a few of those down, but even more so. And here's the problem, because Mussolini was a journalist. You got to remember that. Mussolini depended on the idea of freedom of the press to a certain extent. And what he understood as a journalist was that, well, the problem with freedom of the press is the press always has an interest group or the government, which effectively buys it out and use it for its own nefarious ends. There's actually nothing free about the free press. Again, according to Mussolini, ex the exchanges of ideas, right, in your system, in your society, to debate these issues purely a Roman idea that is perfectly Italian it's perfectly Roman and he accepted that but what happens in a in a social structure where your newspapers and I think we've seen that here in America have been bought out by interest groups then what you have a free press I mean let's go back to the argument that the conservatives made about 15 years ago Remember McCain-Feingold, right? 
and we were talking about how much money you could put in the political system. And the Democrats wanted to limit the money. And I'm no Democrat, for us being never have been, have never voted Democrat. But it was many conservatives saying, no, money equals freedom. Money equals freedom. McCain-Feingold went down. What happened after that? Money continued to flow in, leading to the culmination of the 2020 election, where the beloved corporations that the political right supported for 50 years betrayed them. We've seen a special kind of relationship, let's put it that way, between corporations and the American government. And conservatives have been very upset about this ever since. But they don't know how to deal with it because, again, in the name of freedom and liberty, they believe <laughs> you can put as much money into the political system as you want in the name of freedom and liberty, ironically enough. But that freedom and liberty has been turned on them as corporations have betrayed them and betrayed the cause. Look at the media in America today. Look at the old dinosaur media. Look at the newspapers. I don't know if there's newspapers still around, but look how the right has been fighting the supposed and cherished free press since even before I was born because it's been leaning to the left, because it's been bought out by interest groups, right? You know, when we talk about, on the Catholic side, the infiltration of the church, right? And the various forces after World War II, that have brought on this crisis. Well, it's not, it hasn't been just the Catholic Church that has been infiltrated. It's every institution in the West, starting with the press. And this press actually comes back to haunt the political right. Well, Mussolini saw the same thing in his time in Italy. In Italy at the time, it was oligarchs that were buying it out. And it was communists that always had funding, nefarious funding from somewhere. Probably Russia, most likely. It's probably Stalin, most likely, that was buying up newspapers to ill effect Italian society. What do you do when the enemies of your nation bring in nefarious forces to adversely affect your society when your free press is not a free press anymore, but a free press is controlled by special interests who have their own agenda. Again, turn on MSNBC if you're on the right. Turn on CNN. Go to the New York Times. We're living through it now. Conservatives pull their hair out, but in the name of freedom, there's nothing that can be done about this, right? We just let the system get bogged down or bought up and then we throw our hands up in the air when elections don't go our way. And we have a nation that goes further and further and further to the left. Again, the Europeans were dealing with these problems at least a century before we had these kind of problems in America, right? Because they had the French Revolution and the Bolshevik, Bolshevik Revolution in their midst, right? We had those bodies of oceans that protected us for an extra century. But now with mass transit, mass communications, it's it's here. It's here. We have a nefarious press. Right? What do we do with that? And so that's the issue of freedom of the press. Again, it's complex. Right? Because I, like many conservatives, believe in the idea of free exchanges of information. It's important so we can make informed decisions. I believe in it. But at the same time, what happens when all those forces are bought out by special interests who don't have our interests in mind? We've gone through it with the cable media over the decades. We've gone through it with the newspapers. We've gone through it with the mainstream uh, television networks, right? How much longer is it before the left figures out, let's just buy up all the internet companies and then we won't even be able to share information on the internet. I know the conservatives are going to sue. There's going to be lawsuits. But as we've seen, the right never wins. What happens when the left and the communists consume all the information? Then what, conservatives? You've gotten screwed in the name of freedom and liberty. You go to Italy in the 1930s, 
you're being invaded by Bolsheviks. They're buying up the newspapers. They're influencing society. What do you do? Surrender the country to Bolsheviks in the name of freedom and liberty? Really? See, these things are complex, right? And for us in America, because we've surrendered, we've surrendered to communists, we just throw our hands up in the air and appeal back to ideology. The founding fathers, uh, the, the Constitution, freedom, liberty. We got to get back to the founding. We got to get back to the founding. Guys like Beck are constantly preaching this, right? And and it's like, it's nonsensical because everybody knows we're not going back to the founding. And everybody knows that the institutions have all been infiltrated. Screaming to go back to the founding is nonsensical. It's like a five-year-old that's in denial. What do we do, conservatives? I'm asking the question, how do we fix the system now when it's all been hijacked? This is the problem they understood. Is that a suppression of freedom under fascism in Italy in regards to the press? Yeah, you could argue that. But at the same time, these issues are more nuanced. Bolsheviks are invading. What do you do? See, these are questions that conservatives never answer at the end of the day. Right now, in regards to governance itself, right, and who makes some of these decisions, in that last cast, I brought up pornography as one example. And how do we ban that, right? Because a guy like Timothy Gordon over at Rules for Retrogrades will tell you subsidiarity, subsidiarity, subsidiarity. That's the Catholic way, right? Pope Pius and I detailed it in one particular. Um, you know, encyclical, and then Pope Pius XI, who ironically enough reigned during the time of Mussolini, uh, condemned again in another encyclical, right? Where they're both saying subsidiarity is the way uh, Catholic governance should happen. Okay, fair enough, right? Local government, I get it. And I agree with Timothy Gordon on that. That's the ideal, the ideal, but it's more nuanced than that, okay? Because at the end of the day, the problem Gordon has is he winds up with the same problem as the, the proddy classical liberals. And that is when something goes wrong or goes astray, how do we react, right? Does the church appeal to ideology? Okay, this is what Pope Pius IX said, subsidiarity at all costs. Okay, but Mussolini comes into power, right? And there's some elements of subsidiarity in fascism, there is localism in fascism, right? But there's also a lot of things that are dictated from the top down. To a certain degree, it is a command economy, right? Why does Pope Pius XI not condemn Mussolini, right? And I'm not talking about the encyclical uh, non abbiamo bisogno. I get it. There was a condemnation over Catholic action. That had to do with the Catholic youth, Right. The church and the fascist state battled it out, but they worked it out in the end, okay? And then between 31 and 38, the church and the fascist state were in good graces. Things were going very well, right? Actually, you could argue between 26 and 38, things were going great because it started at the Lateran Accord. Remember, when the Lateran Accords passed, the church was popping champagne, right? The Monsignor's were just beyond themselves, and the bishops were beyond themselves, Mussolini was seen as a hero by the church, right? Now, again, this is a guy that has elements of a command economy in Italy at the time, right? It's not the ideal, um, what do you call it, bastion of subsidiarity. There's some of it, but some things are not subsidiarity in Italy at the time. And yet, Pope Pius XI, calls Mussolini a man sent by divine providence. And the church awards Mussolini with the highest award a lay person could receive. What is it? The, the cross of the Holy Secular, I believe. I, I don't know how to pronounce it. The church looks the other way to a certain degree from Pope Pius IX. Does that mean Pope Pius XI and Pope Pius IX are contradicting each other? No, no, not. The church is simply reacting to the circumstances at hand. Yeah, subsidiarity is ideal. And Mussolini gave them some of that. 
But at the same time, Mussolini was regarded by the church, or at least many prelates in the church, as a hero for reuniting the Catholic Church to Italy and making Italy an integralist Catholic nation. Now, I have not gone through the relationship between Mussolini and Pope Pius XI as closely as I like. But here we have a fundamental issue of governance, right? Church may have a, 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 a general ideological understanding of governance. But does the church always stick with that? Does the church always hold firm to that? Like the classical liberals right now, we got to get back to the founding principles. Or does the church say, okay, this isn't ideal, right? We would like more subsidiarity, which is better. It's more effective. However, under the circumstances, we still have to govern. See, the problem is, is it's not so much subsidiarity is the problem. It's a good thing. It's a great thing. But when governments don't cooperate, the church still needs to take care of its flock whatever system it works under. And you could call Pope Pius XI a sellout for not forcing Mussolini or condemning Mussolini to go to this purest, you know, kind of subsidiarity idea, uh, you know, based on ideological principles. Or you could say, okay, this isn't perfect, but we can work with this guy. We can work with this guy. And that's what the church did. It worked with Mussolini. And to a certain degree, if violated, to a certain degree, issues of subsidiarity. Because Mussolini had, a, to a certain extent, a command economy. Now, Mussolini didn't touch nothing at the, you know, what mattered to the people at the local level. I don't think there was any tax system on the poor. I, I got a book, um, what's his name? Schneider. Was it Herbert Schneider? The fascist government of Italy. He went through some of the tax systems or the taxes in Italy, the poor weren't even taxed in Italy. Um, and, and I know my grandfather, who was a fisherman in Italy, never paid taxes. I my, my mom told me those stories. It's just, he went out, caught his fish, came back, set up his little stand, sold his fish, came home. Never, there was no income tax system. There was no filing for taxes. There was none of that. Taxes were, were mostly levied on salary workers, right? and business right so effectively down at the local level when you're dealing with everyday life it was pretty free down there uh for most people um i'm not even sure there was property taxes in italy it was pretty free to buy and sell there was a market economy in italy there was private property in italy. mussolini not only was he in favor of private property not only did he think it was a, a bedrock principle that was important he was even against the inheritance tax he understood how generational wealth had to be passed down uh in order to keep businesses operating right um and, and so th that's why it's hard to say that fascism eh, well, at least with mussolini it's you know marxism without the internationalism mussolini was in a collectivist had a low tax system believed in private property didn't suppress the proletariat, didn't collectivize. Was there command issues to the, to the economy? Yes. And why? Because they were against all this unfair trade with the British and the Americans who wanted to dictate terms and conditions. Remember, he had to deal with the British Empire. And the British Empire, they were getting theirs all over the world from their colonies. And when the British and the Americans came to the bargaining table, they were in a position of power, and they acted with that power. Mussolini said, no, wait a minute. I'll deal with you. We could trade, but we're equal in this, right? Right? But again, the British felt that they were the superior race on the planet because of their, their global empire. In some ways, you could say they, they were. They had a powerful empire, right, until it all collapsed in World War II. So, so you have that. Um, obviously, with trade was one issue where you had some command issues. Uh, the other one was usury and debt. Okay, now this is a touchy subject right here. But banking and usury was a big part of World War II. I got to tell you, 
And what Mussolini did not want, and this is where he had some command aspects of the economy, was international financiers coming in to buy out the political system and to buy out the Italian citizenry. He felt that its citizens should not be indebted to bankers, especially international bankers who had no interest in building up uh, the Italian nation. Mussolini, when he got into power, uh, Italy had a ton of debt left by the previous socialist parliament. He took out one loan from J.P. Morgan. One loan. I think it was a billion lira or something like that because he had to pay off the debts. But he actually balanced his budgets, right? One of the reasons that Italian Italy was so far behind technologically in the war was one of the areas Mussolini cut in the late 20s and early 30s was actually the Air Force in order for him to balance the budget and not have to take out more loans. He took out one loan, he paid it back, and then did not take any more loans out after that. And that's what really upset the international financiers. If you study the history of international financier, you know they play countries between each other in order to profit. Right? It's about getting nations in debt and all their people in debt. In that respect, he controlled the economy. I'm sure there was a few other ways, don't get me wrong. But at the local level, if you owned a shop, you were a fisherman, contractor, you earned to keep, you got to keep your money. There was there wasn't a whole lot there. There was debt being set up in every post that could kind of keep an eye on things from the top down. Without a doubt, you had some of that. But for the most part, people were free at the bottom. So, and that's the other aspect that I'm trying to figure out here when we talk about how fascism controlled every aspect of Italian life. Economically, it's a mixed bag, but I think you kind of understand why on some of those issues. I got to go deeper to the economics. I'm sure there's some issues there that probably the federal government or the central government had no business uh, partaking in. But I, I haven't found that yet, and I'll take a look at that. And so, again, subsidiarity, it's ideal. But what happens when the central government doesn't play that kind of game? What does the church do? Throw its hands up in the air. Sorry, subsidiarity, we're not playing ball. No, Pope Pius XI played ball with Mussolini. They worked it out. Right? Um, okay, I, listen. Again, I respect Mr. Timothy Gordon. Um, I think he's a very smart guy. Um, but his argument of subsidiarity is very interesting. Um, you know, we had something about, what, six, nine months ago where the state of Ohio hmm, had an amendment um, referendum on abortion. State of Ohio decided to enshrine in their constitution the legal right to abort your child. Ohio is a red state, guys. It's a red state. That's subsidiarity at work. That's subsidiarity. The subsidiarity Mr. Gordon is talking about. Here's my question. Now what? What happens when subsidiarity fails? Interesting enough, after that vote came down, I was watching um, his brother's podcast, Dave Gordon. Nice guy, too. Devout Catholic, too. He worked at Church Militant before it all went down over there. But Dave Gordon addressed that problem. And Dave Gordon, his brother, and I, listen, they're, they're, they're different human beings, right? I can't, I'm not trying to say, okay, this is contradictory. I'm not saying that at all, but... Dave Gordon has been a proponent of subsidiarity. He supported his brother's idea in, in his book, uh, Catholic Republic. I haven't read Catholic Republic, but subsidiarity is one of uh, Timothy Gordon's big platforms. But Gordon came out after that election and said, man, I, I'm all, you know, subsidiarity is the thing, is the Catholic way to go. But now what? What do we do with Ohio? I'm not in favor of the federal government coming in here, but... What other choice do we have, right? I mean, I'm paraphrasing there, but that's essentially what Dave Gordon said, right? Because the question is, right, let's assume, I don't know, 
let's assume in, uh, I don't know, during the time of the Regisamento, right? Italian unification. Pope Pius IX writing a subsidiarity. He could understand why. Because the French Revolution was running through Europe. We have these con re communist leftist revolution that are consuming these states or these smaller provinces and consolidating them into bigger liberal nations, right? And now they're coming after Italy. And you can understand why um, Pope Pius IX is arguing in favor of subsidiarity because he's about to lose the papal states. We all know that. And it was, I mean, it, you know, Mussolini favored the revolution. I always go with the church. That's me. I'm Catholic first and foremost. But you can understand why he's writing this. But what happens after the fact? Right? What happens when your nation has been united all of a sudden? And you're dealing with this with politicians top down because that's been the essence of the American and French Revolution. Ever since those two revolutions that encompass the entire world, we've had nothing but massive nation states. The smaller provinces, the smaller tiny nations, they've all been swallowed up, including America. And we still got to govern this thing, right? If you're the Catholic Church, if you're Pope Pius the ninth or 10th or 11th, what do you do? Do you say, oh, wait a minute, this nation consolidated all of its providences? It really doesn't have subsidiarity standards anymore. Okay, we're going to stick to ideology, back away, and do nothing at this point? That's the point of liberalism. That was the point of the, of the French Revolution to begin with. So what do you do now? I think Pope Pius the Eleventh kind of answers that. Yes, he still argues in favor of subsidiarity, but he still worked with Mussolini. He worked with what he had. Right? Now, in the big scheme of things, what does that mean? Um, and, you know, as far as the size of the state, the influence of the state, again, the worship of the state, when it comes to politics, how much of a role did, or influence, or power um, did the fascist state take, right? Um, we probably have to go deeper through some of the economic issues. What Herbert Schneider argues is, is that the first four years of Mussolini's reign between 22 and 26, he really went with more laissez-faire principles in Italy. The economy was truly struggling. It was in debt. And Mussolini used markets and freer markets to help rebuild the Italian economy. But starting right around 27, 28, 29, Mussolini started to take a little bit more and more control of the economy, right? And I think this is going to have to happen if you're going to implement the corporatist system, right? Where you're going to have the government basically as the broker between labor and capital. This was always going to happen. Um, and then as we get into the mid thirties, Herbert Schneider argues that the Italian economy, the Italian government is taking more and more power. The book was written in 36. So we don't really know what happens to 37, 38, 39, I would imagine with the war around the corner and the winds of war blowing, he probably took more control, especially because you were going to need the funding for the world wars that were coming. So it's an interesting mixed record. On one hand, you have Mussolini that has more laissez-faire. He uses market principles in the mid-20s, but he begins to tighten the noose as we go into the late 20s and early 30s. But remember, I think the reason, obviously the corporatist system that he's implementing probably has a lot to do with that, but it's also the Great Depression. That's the other issue that happens in that time span. What year was the Great Depression? I forget now. Was it 29, I believe? And then the issue is you have some fundamental problems in Italy, right? In America, 
under the name of laissez-faire capitalism, we accepted um, the soup lines. We accepted Americans living out of cardboard boxes, right? And we argue that capitalism will fix itself effectively. People are going to suffer, but no government intervention. In Italy, it was different. First of all, Italy did not have, was not a wealthy nation. It didn't have a welfare state of any kind. And so when the shit hit the fan, excuse my language, government intervened to help out struggling Italians. Now, now the Great Depression did not hit Italy as hard as America, right? Mainly because Italy was agricultural. Mussolini didn't take out a lot of loans, usury and debt, that kind of stuff. I mean, obviously hit the whole world, but Italy survived it better, but there are still fundamental problems um, in Italy. And, and I guess this is one of the critiques that Mussolini will get with that centralized authoritarian government. One of the things he did was he put rent restrictions on landowners, right? He even had a prison for landlords. And so, you know, and, and, and so you could hear the scream, the bloody screams of the free marketeers, the capitalists, which to a certain degree, I understand. I've owned property and I understand that that's a problem, right? When you're manipulating um, the, the prices of rents and things of that nature. But I think, again, there's a difference between Italy and America. With Americans, we have this laissez-faire spirit of rugged individualism, all that stuff. Americans can accept, to a certain degree, a bunch of other Americans living in cardboard boxes. I mean, look at the homelessness crisis we have today. We just walk right by it in the cities, right? We just, it's there. What can we do about it? Blah, blah, blah. In Italy, in a nation that's Catholic, purely Catholic, was that ever going to be acceptable? I don't think the church would have accepted that. And this is where Mussolini intervened and put rent mandates or he put restrictions, he put rent control in. So families could stay in their homes. Now you say, well, that's socialism. He's taking control of the of the markets. That's bad. Let freedom reign, right? Okay, yeah, I understand that. And I understand the difficulties and the problems of that. But let's bear in mind, Mussolini didn't run debt. Mussolini ran an economy where he balanced the budget. And Mussolini didn't have a welfare straight state. Not to the degree that we have now in the West, right? Imagine if America today cut off the printing press. What would happen to America today? I would argue half this country starves. Starves. Mussolini put in rent control. America prints money. Tell me what the difference is. Tell me. I, I'm not an economist. I, I could get this analogy completely wrong. Please correct me. I don't like either one. But what happens when you have families out on the street because they can't afford rent? Step over them in a Catholic nation? Would the church have stood by? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't have an answer to that one. Maybe you guys can tell me here. So I get back to what I started with. These things are complex. They're nuances. It's a different culture. It's a different time. Um, there is a top-end command element to fascism, without a doubt. Some of it is not good. Some of it is more nuanced. But this is why I tell Americans all the time, you can't look at every other nation from American sensibilities. It's a different nation, different time, different circumstances, um, and different values for that matter. You know, as Americans, we've gotten we've gotten used to printing all this money. And that's the funny thing about it is that, you know, America after World War II becomes an empire. You know, it's it's globally expanding. You know, we're we're coming back 
from the war. It's the days of Levittown. It's the baby boom, the 50s. Everybody's having kids. Everybody is now starting to advance or buying homes. And the American economy is booming. But the irony of it all is, how long did that last? How long did it last? Right? Come home from 45. When do we really start printing money? I, I, I'm i sure we were printing some money. Don't get me wrong with the Federal Reserve. But once Nixon takes us off the gold standard in 72, was that 20 years, roughly 25 years? And the printing machine turns on? <laughs> Big deal. Two decades, right? And even that, even that, let, let, let's talk about the prosperity of the, of the late 40s and 50s. All that is because the government was building a war machine. Government spending turned that economy on. And then once things start cooling off from the war, we start printing money. And we've never stopped in America. So, I don't know. I mean, again, I'm open to the critiques on Italy in 1930s and 40s. Many mistakes Benito Mussolini made. But we have to stop pretending ourselves that we don't have some of the same elements at this point, right? You know, Timothy Gordon, again, would say that, well, it all fell apart after the 14th Amendment in 1868, after the Civil War, right? So he will tell you, hey, go to a red state, pack it up, go to a red state. The thing is over, it's done, right? America was um, a good crypto-Catholic republic for about, what, 75, 80 years, but then you know, the equal rights protection destroyed it all. Okay. So we don't even get a century with this crypto Catholic Republic. How do we fix it now? No, we can't fix it. Move to a red state and because it's all going to collapse. Okay. Well, I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that. I have no idea, to be honest with you. You know? And then we get what? We're straight into the progressive era, right? With Woldrow Wilson and, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders followed by FDR, one radical leftist presidency after another that implement expansion and the growth of government. Is it much different than what was happening in Italy? I don't know. I think you could argue that it was just an era of progressivism that was brought on by the American and the French Revolution. I think you could argue that. If you want to say that the American Revolution had some more restrictions, had some Catholic elements of subsidiarity. Sure, that's fine. I like those ideas, but you got to be able to maintain it and control it, right? You have to have the cultures and the social structures in place. That's what I think fascism was trying to do. I'm not sure it got them all right. I'm sure there was lots of abuses, right? Um, I, I think... Again, one of the critiques with the fascist system, and I have to look into this more, that I would probably have a big problem with is how the court systems were structured. If the court systems were manipulated by the regime, that could be a massive problem, without a doubt. That, I think, is open to criticism. <clears throat> and, and to what degree it interfered in the economy. But again, I brought up some of those nuances. So... Um, and I think it comes down to whether you want to believe that fascism was the worship of the state. I And, and you know what? I see some elements of that. I'm not going to lie to you. I think what fascism does, I agree with Emilio Gentile, that it does bring elements of certain conformity to fascist ideals, right? And maybe to an extreme. But it's like I've said before, I think all nations have a form of secular religion. I think America has had a form of secular religion, right? We view our founding fathers like saints. We view the Constitution as something inspired to something akin to the Bible, right? We have this narrative in World War I, World War II, again, led by radical leftists, that we went to save Europe, right? That here we come to save the day, kind of a thing. We see ourselves 
as saviors. This is the inherent goodness of America. And then we fought in the Cold War and defeated communism, right? Again, the good guys won because we stood up to evil because America is a shining city on a hill. America is the last best hope for mankind. Manifest destiny, right? Americans bought that. You know? You see it now all over the place. I see Trump flags all over the place in middle of America here. People are gearing up for their civic duty to go vote, which is a, which is really the sacrament of secular democracies, right? You know, you go to D.C., what do we have in D.C.? We have monuments. We have statues of presidents, right? Lincoln, Washington, Jefferson, right? Where else do you have uh, statues of semi-divine beings, right, of sorts, right, if you want to call it Vatican, Rome, Vatican City. We have statues of saints. We have statues of presidents and leaders of America here, right? Shrines. We have shrines, just like we have Catholic shrines all over the world. In many ways, the American secular religion is copied the Catholic Church, just like Mr. Gentili here argues that the fascists copied the Catholic Church. Right? Right? The symbol of the fascists was what? Was the, 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 the branch of sticks, right? The fasci. It's a bundle of sticks, right? I believe that same symbol is up, I believe, in the Senate. We have that same symbol or the, the House of Representatives. I forgot which one it was. I forgot which one it was. And even with that, you look at the President of the United States very powerful man. You say that, well, we vote him in. Okay. I would argue special interests vote him in. <laughs> the most powerful man in the world. Right? More powerful than any monarch. I'm just telling you, I just don't think it's all that much more different. There may be some differences in conformity. And, and and that's the irony about what I mentioned in that last cast was this um, um, Emilio Gentili. He actually wrote a book on how George W. Bush used evangelicalism, the imagery of religion, to win the 2000 and 2004 elections, right? So he sees this secular religion, not just in fascism, but he sees it to a certain degree, what it sounds like in America as well, too. Right? I think every nation has it. You have to find a way to conform society to your government at the end of the day, especially these governments have become more centralized and more controlled, right? We have to have our mythos, right? Just like the factions had a mythos, right? Of, you know, the Roman Empire or, or you know, the Regisamento, the Italian unification. What do we have in America? Well, the George Washington chopped down the cherry tree. Did he? I mean, Benjamin Franklin flying a kite. We we have our religious devotions, our sort of biblical stories, right? Every nation has that. The question is, how do we break down the conformity? How much does it conflict? Or at least, well, yeah, how much how much confliction do we have between individual rights and the collective good, right? This is the debate between communists and classical liberals that we debate every day on talk radio and the internet everywhere else, right? And the question is, when does a nation go too far in its secular religion and ultimately the worship of the state? Because in some ways, in America, we have the worship of the state. There's a few things that the federal government in America has recently mandated. I'm not going to mention those here right now, but they were all forced to comply. Is that the worship of the state? Is it? This has been the trend of modern secular liberalism over the past 200 years since the Enlightenment. In many ways, fascism it's a byproduct of that liberalism. It was born out of liberalism. Granted, I think it was a 
a right wing rea reaction to a certain extent, right? Because a lot of them were socialists and communists, and they were pushing away from that communist ideology. But it was born within the realm of liberalism, and it has the very weaknesses of liberalism embedded in it. But I think they were trying to react in a positive way. I'm not sure they got it all right. But I'm not sure it was all that much different than what we have today in these liberal republics either. It's all about power at the end of the day. I know as Americans, we get excited about, you know, the, the same. We have the peaceful transition of power. Okay? That's fine. That's a good thing. I'm not going to say that. But politics and power have always gone hand in hand. If you're not willing to take power to defend your values, far left progressive and even more directly communists are going to take it from you at some point. If not with direct power and violence, they will manipulate, they will propagandize, they will lie, they will cheat, they will steal. They'll do whatever they have to do to take control of your system. That's what we've seen over the past century. This is why all these liberal republics have gone bankrupt. What do you do then? Get back to the founding principles of America. Is that all you got, Glenn? It's Glenn back. That's what he tells us. Right? I don't know what the answer is in America. But I know there's many citizens that are frustrated. I know many Americans are frustrated. I just think as we move forward, I will predict that there will be no difference eventually in America than what happened in Italy in the 1920s and 30s. It will lead to chaos at some point. The system will break down and people will react. And as I've heard before, if those good old boys in Texas ever rise up, they'll be called fascists. They will. Um, and then we'll see where the political right stands, right? Again, that's not my cup of tea. Um, I look at this from a historical standpoint. I give you my thoughts. I share my thoughts with you all. I just think what happened in Italy in 1920s and 30s was unique. It was different. And they were dealing with their own circumstances. And again, if somebody could tell me how the Italians, how the Italians were supposed to deal with the Bolshevik revolution, I'm open to an opinion. I'm I'm a I'm a big believer in subsidiarity. I'm a big believer in individual rights. I'm a big believer, as much as I make fun of it, I'm a big believer in freedom and liberty within a Christian context. I am. I am. But I also understand nuance and circumstances. We critique that era in Italian history. And every time we do it, we have to underscore what was happening there. Right? Because even in this book with the Emilio Gentile, the Bolsheviks were dismissed just as Political opposition. The fascists had to put down political opposition. Okay? They were communists. They weren't, you know, this isn't, you know, the Republicans and the Libertarians, okay? You know, voting on a candidate, on on and balloting it out on who's, you know, believes in, in, in less government, right? These are Bolsheviks. After World War II, they took over half the planet. They tried to take over Spain, but a, but a fascist by the name of Franco pushed them back with the support of the church. Mussolini had the support of the church in Italy. Just keep that in mind. All this stuff matters because it fills in the nuances and the context. Was Italy a worship of the state? Yeah, it was. To a certain degree, it was. 
But then again, I think all the liberal republics of the West have become the worship of the state. Look how big and intrusive all these nations have become. Look how much they manipulate all of our lives, how much they tax us, how much they regulate us, how many mandates they put on us. This is a byproduct of the Enlightenment. Whether it's in the fascist form or in the communist form or in the classical liberal form, it's all devolved into strong centralized governments at the expense of individuals. I don't like none of them myself, but I do care about circumstance and being fair to history and being fair to our ancestors who had to make tough decisions in very tough times. Ladies and gentlemen, I wanna thank you for joining me tonight. This was chapter 14 of Mussolini, an Italian American experience. Thank you again. Good night, everybody.